Today, we're finally looking at and comparing the biggest differences between Sigma's FP versus the FPL. So in the wake of my FP review video, Sigma reached out to me and they did send me their entire line of iSeries contemporary lenses along with the FPL. And I've already put out a couple videos on those iSeries contemporary lenses along as uh, quite a few videos regarding the FP. I'll leave a little playlist down in the description below in case you're new here. If so, welcome, and I encourage you to check those past videos out. However, the amount of time that Sigma allowed me to have those lenses and the FPL was a very, very short amount of time but I did the best I could with the time that I was given. And because of that, this video is extremely limited to only those items that I was most concerned about in regards to the FP versus the FPL. So with that being said, this is the itinerary for today's video. Higher frame rates, low light performance, rolling shutter, and difference in stills. So from the outside, these two cameras are pretty damn identical. In fact, I do wanna throw out a side note here that Sigma offers a deal for all original FP users because the FPL, they did make some cosmetic aesthetic differences in regards to the buttons and the way they feel and the way they operate because there have been quite a few FP users that have reported that their back scroll wheel uh, kind of stops working over time. I have yet to experience that. However, if that does happen to you, Sigma offers this for free. All you have to do is pay for the shipping and you know give up your camera for a little bit of time to be shipped off to Sigma's headquarters in New York. And they will replace all of the buttons on the original FP with the FPL updated buttons, as well as they do clean your sensor as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But from the inside, what separates these two cameras the most is the difference of the two sensors. So the FP is equipped with 24.6 megapixels, while the FPL has 61 megapixels. Keep in mind, I'm talking about effective megapixels, which translates to the FP gives you 6K resolution raw photos, while the FPL gives you 9K resolution raw photos. Now, the newer sensor inside of the FPL also comes with an optical low pass filter which does help reduce aliasing and more, as well as cutting down the sharpness of the overall image. Now, when you first hear that, I imagine most people would be like, oh yeah, you definitely want that. However, in my experience, in regards to these two specific Sigma cameras, my naked eye could not make out the difference. But you can be your own judge of that because there is plenty of footage that we will be looking at and comparing in today's video. Now, the biggest added feature of the FPL is probably the crop zoom function, which works in both stills and cine mode. Me personally, I have zero interest in that, so I didn't even mess with it. What I will say though, is that the FP does have DC mode, which does punch in on the sensor without cutting down on your resolution, basically allowing you to go from full frame to super 35. And it does come in handy if you need a tighter focal length, but just don't happen to have a longer lens with you. So that DC mode does come in clutch very often. And in my opinion, there is no loss of picture detail and it does work in both cine and stills mode. Whereas with the FPL, the crop zoom function is going to give you less resolution and it gets lower every time you punch in. In other words, the full crop zoom of five times is the equivalent of 1080p at only two megapixels. Whereas the DC mode on the FP still gives you full 4K resolution. So that is something to be aware of. There's also the popular opinion that the FPL has better autofocus capabilities. However, in my opinion and experience, neither the FP nor the FPL are catered for people looking for decent autofocus or for users who are depending on autofocus. And I've already talked about that and shown things of that in my past videos. Again, links are down below. 
So that's kind of the most common differences that you'll see people talking about. But now let's take a look at my testing with the differences that I think matter the most, specifically when talking about using these cameras for cinematography use. The biggest thing that stood out to me on paper right away was the fact that the FPL does crop in at higher frame rates. So with the FPL, when you jump to 100 or 120 frames per second, there is a crop of 1.67 times on the sensor. Whereas the FP, does not do that. The next biggest concern for me was the difference in low light performance. Now, when the FPL was first released, Sigma admitted that the FP is far superior in low light. And how do you predict that the low light um, um, capabilities of the camera will be if I compare it to the previous model? The existing FP is superior than our new FPL. Next up is a topic that I most definitely get hit up the most about in regards to the FP, and that is rolling shutter. Now, do keep in mind that I am a red Komodo owner and user, and if you are unaware, the Komodo does have a global shutter. I've already done plenty of videos on this topic in the past. Again, there are links down below if you are new here. With that being said, anytime I use any other camera other than the Komodo, the rolling shutter is always super noticeable to me. And I recently camera opt on a job using the Sony FX6, and in my opinion, the rolling shutter of the FX6 is just as bad as the rolling shutter of the little FP. Just my opinion. But remember, the Komodo makes all other rolling shutters look like dog shit. 
So with that, I definitely included the Komodo in the rolling shutter test. So let's roll that footage now. And finally, we come to the last test where the FPL actually wins, and that is stills mode. Now, there are a few things that are helping the FPL out in this regard. That is the higher megapixel count, which is giving a higher resolution for stills mode, and that low pass filter. So let's dive into Lightroom and compare these images now. This one on the left is the Sigma FP. This one on the right is the FPL. Now I will say this, when they're on the day, and as you can see, just look at the clouds. You know, this was literally back to back. Like the clouds didn't move, the sun didn't move. So this is almost exact, you know, within, you know, 30 seconds of each other, if not less amount of time, these two pictures were taken with two separate cameras, same exact settings, same exact lens. I mean, even down to the color picture profile and all the little tweaks I make to each color picture profile. I shoot on the Sigma FP daily. So if you follow me on Instagram over there at Kid Tech, thank you if you do, by the way, you know, every now and then I post some cool BTS. I post some cool screen grabs from passion projects of mine, but then also, you know, I post a lot of photos. I take photos on a daily basis. That actually was the main reason why I wanted the FP. But also if you saw my latest passion projects spent, you know that 
not only is it a great stills camera being full frame and all of that, being so small and compact, but also at its base core, it is hands down the number one most minimalist cinema camera. So I'm actually using it to film this talking head right now, but if you take a peek at some of this BTS here, sneak peek of the breakdown of the spent passion project, you'll see I was literally as minimalist as you could get with that camera. And that's one of the reasons I love it. We were able to just walk into a gas station, steal a couple shots. Um, again, that's why, you know, there were moments where it was falling in and out of focus. If you saw spent, if you're new here, I'll leave a link down in the description below. We got a lot to talk about on that project. We'll save that for that video. Let's get in and compare these stills. What I'm meaning to tell you is I can tell you from experience, just going from the, looking down the EVF because Sigma also sent me the EVF for the FPL too. So I, I didn't even have to swap my electronic viewfinder between each camera. It had its own. So I was literally going, looking down the EVF of the FP putting that camera down, picking up the FPL and looking at that through its EVF, I can tell you, I personally did did notice a significant difference having my eyeball that close to the EVF. Same exact, you know, you know, there's no advancement over one EVF 11 versus another EVF 11, they're exact same EVF. What it really is though, I think it's seeing the significant difference with your eyeball that close to the screen. You know, you're talking about a 3. million dot OLED screen that that EVF 11 has. Beautiful EVF, by the way. I wish I could use it on my Komodo. I love it that much. You know, I could instantly see the difference between the FP and the FPL. You know, you can really, with your, with your eyeball that close to the screen, you can really tell the difference between 6K and 9K. Uh, you know, quite honestly. Yeah, that's what we're looking at here. On the left is the FP and on the right is the FPL. But you can just notice by the clouds how back to back these photos were taken. Um, I mean, even this little group of tourists, women here, it's the same tourists. So this is back to back. Let me show you the point of um, focus was the Schmidt Welcome Plaza uh, sign. This was the central portion of the frame. It was dead center in the frame. And, and so that's my general point of focus there. So on the left-hand side is the FP. Meanwhile, over here on the right-hand side is the FPL. Now I'm zooming in. We're dealing with, um, you know, YouTube compression and all that. But however, you know, this is fairly, fairly similar. The biggest differences that I can tell, there is a slight variance in color. Now again, every single setting was exactly the same. So notice when I, I'm, what I'm gonna do here now, I'm gonna zoom in on this palm tree because this is really where you tell the difference. Zoom in on this palm tree a little bit and can you see the difference between these two palm trees? There is a slight color variance. So again, the left-hand side, this one is the FP. Over here on the right-hand side, this is the FPL. The FPL has a slightly different variance in color rendering. I don't know if that's because of the optical low pass filter that the FPL has, you know, that could very well influence the color rendering, but whatever the case may be, it's a little bit off. Now I do remember in watching that video that I sampled earlier, that Cine D video when the FPL was first launched, I feel like I recall in that video that, you know, the, the CEO or whoever that guy is from Sigma, I, I feel like maybe not that video specifically, but there was a video that I recall where that same gentleman was talking about how the FPL, their engineers found a way to enhance the dynamic range of the FPL. So supposedly it has one or two stops more dynamic range than the FP. I don't know in my own testing, I wouldn't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I also don't agree that the FP even has what was it like 11 or 12 stops? Like that is, I definitely don't believe in that. In my initial review of the FP, again, I'll put a link if you're totally brand new here, never seen my ugly face before. I will say that I did very briefly, you know, show my dynamic range test in that original FP review. And you know, it, it, I would say the FP has nine usable stops of dynamic range, okay? And that's being very lenient, okay? Because, uh, and, and I'm working very diligently and very uh, methodically uh, for about the, you know, for almost two months now on this video, I've, I'm slowly developing on, you know, the interesting quirks of the dynamic range of the FP, how it exposes. It's very, an, it's, an, it's an odd camera when it comes to exposure. And now that they have released the false color tool for the FP, it really makes 
this video that I'm working on much more easy to demonstrate uh, the, the things that I'm finding. And that's just because I use the FP every day, both for cine mode and stills mode, and just also, you know, comparing it to the way how something like my Red Komodo handles exposure. Um, and the fact that the Red Komodo, you're able to see the true false color of the raw data. Whereas something like the FP is a very interesting camera and I, I just, I'll save it for that video, but um, with that being said, yeah, the dynamic range of the FP is, is up for debate, let's just say that. Uh, but I do think it's interesting how the FPL has way different color, not way different, but I, I mean, I can see it with my eyes and I have a red-green colorblind. Maybe there's not a difference then, <laughs> right? I just had that revelation too, you know? I do have a, a pretty wicked red-green colorblind that some of you are aware of. You've been on the channel for a minute. So, uh, you know, yeah, maybe so. Maybe there isn't a color variance. Maybe it just looks that way to my eye. Or maybe it's not as severe to normal vision. You know, I don't know. You guys tell me in the comments, right? But I definitely am noticing a difference between the color of this tree trunk versus the color of this tree trunk. And again, the FPL is on the right-hand side. Okay, so now let's just zoom out here. Another thing that's good for having a, a camera with over, it actually is like 9.5K resolution in stills mode with the FPL. You know, it depends, like if you're a hardcore photographer and you're doing huge, huge prints, you know, then maybe, you know, 61 megapixels, 9.5K resolution can help you out. Because see, if I punch in on this, we're going in, in, and again, this is just the JPEG. This is not the, this is not the raw. Um, we can zoom in on this. And now look here, this is the most underexposed area of the shot. Um, and now if I do that on the FP, we can just kind of compare these areas. Now granted, we had different people in the shot at the time. This is, this is at LACMA, this is kind of a world famous museum in the, in the heart of Hollywood here. But if you notice, um, the more I zoom in on this, we can kind of see, I mean now again, the FP is on the left side, the FPL is on the right side of the screen here. I wanna see how far, because Earlier when I was doing this, the pixels really started falling apart. Oh, there we go. See, we have some we have some banding on the FP there. Whereas on the FPL, it's withholding all that information quite well. Again, that could be um, or the result of many things. Again, the FP is on the left-hand side with this weird banding going on. The FPL, it's there, but not nearly as bad. Now, this could be, the again, we are doing insane pixel peeping here, okay? Keep that in mind, along with YouTube compression. But it is what it is, right? There is some severe banding in those shadow areas with the FP. And a lot of, there's two different reasons why the FPL it doesn't suffer the, from that as bad. And that's one, because of the optical low pass filter that's in the FPL um, and also, you know, having way more pixels and they're jammed in the same sensor plane area. So that helps, you know, that this is, this is an area where that definitely helps. So now if we zoom out of this, you know, when you pull out, it's much harder to tell uh, to my eye anyways, especially when we zoom all the way out and we experience the whole photo for what it is, right? So then you go, oh yeah, you know, you know, at first glance, you know, these, these photos are pretty damn identical, but the reality is, you know, once we get in there and really start looking, they're not. I mean, even if you, even looking at it like this, you look at these gray lamp posts with the FP on the left side, and then you look on the right, the, the picture on the right, which is the FPL, you know, look at the lamp posts of the FPL versus the lamp posts of the FP. You know, there is a slight difference in there in the terms of contrast that the contrast difference might be what's affecting the the color to my eyeballs. That is very possible as well. Again, I think that's a result of the optical low pass filter. The sky, the saturation of the sky is almost identical though to my eyeball. Now, one thing I will say, I did shoot these handheld. I'm holding the camera a little bit higher when I did the FPL. And one way I know that is if I zoom in on this, uh, this tree right here, Look at it on the FP, it's not nearly as high. I actually was holding the FPL a little bit higher because I was doing these handouts. So that's why, and you can tell, this is why the corner of the frame, we're seeing a lot more of this palm tree on the FPL than we were with the FP. But if we look at these shots side by side, I mean, the detail is, is remaining on both of these cameras really well. Now granted, this is almost on the same focal plane as the central focus point of that Schmidt Welcome Plaza logo sign. Um, so it, it's not that bad out of focus even at an F4. 
Um, you know, but it is slightly soft because it wasn't quite on the same focal plane as where I was focusing at. But this is nice. I mean, it's retaining the detail. I mean, the FP is holding it down next to that FPL, you know, considering they say, oh, the FPL sensor is, you know, superior or whatever. But, you know, if you ask me, you look at the cine mode. In cine mode, I would choose the FP every time. Stills mode, I probably would go for the FPL, uh, quite honestly, if I was only shooting stills. So my conclusion remains the same that it was before the day I even tested the FPL. And that is that the FP most definitely is the camera to choose, especially if cinematography is your main squeeze. However, if you're a big time stills shooter and video is more of an afterthought, then the FPL would be the way to go. Now, I'm sure that there's folks out there that just must have the optical low-pass filter, and perhaps you may have seen some differences or think you saw some differences in my video samples. And in that case, then, yeah, by all means, the FPL would be the better choice. However, do keep in mind that you will lose that angle of view on those higher frame rates, as well as your low light performance will definitely suffer if you do go with the FPL. In my opinion, the FPL brings nothing special to the table that is worthy of my extra $1,000. I shoot stills all the time. I'm talking daily usage. I carry this camera with me everywhere. I shoot stills all the time, and I am very pleased with the results. One thing I wanna point out is that the QR code generator made comparing the FP and the FPL very, very simple. As soon as I took the FPL out of the box, I updated the firmware and instantly loaded in all of my favorite settings using the QR code from my FP. Again, if you are new here, I'll leave a link down below to my QR code so you can check out my favorite settings. It's super fast, easy, simple to use. I just absolutely love it. It's just a great feature. Something else I discovered and was playing around with while comparing these two cameras was the ability to pull Cinema DNG still files from any raw video clip. And this is a super awesome feature because both the FP and the FPL allow you to play back raw video clips in camera, and then you can easily just select and pull Cinema DNG stills from any raw video while you're reviewing it all in camera. So there you have it, folks. Thanks for watching. I want to give a shout out to all of my loyal Dog Times Patreon supporters. If you're interested in the Patreon, there's always links down below. Uh, I encourage you to go to the Patreon homepage and check out some feedback there. We do have an exclusive members only Discord chat. I love that. I want to give a shout out to the members of the Patreon producers tier. That's Mike Skinner and Fred Parr. I also want to give a shout out to our Pro Tips member for the YouTube membership here on the YouTube channel. That's Visit VR. As always, thank you all for watching. Thanks for the support. And uh, yeah, that's a big fat fucking wrap. Okay, so I need to make sure and use this. Ah, it just kicked off. The... <laughs> The fan of that small rig RC220B is quite loud uh, to the point where it was disrupting this audio. So hopefully I have that. Uh, however, it, it didn't last long. It cut off before I had time to grab my cell phone, <laughs> but at least it will be in the actual raw footage of this video. There goes that light again. That is the fan noise of the small rig RC220B. Do you hear it? This is a really badass, uh, like $1,500 Sennheiser boom mic that I have here. Um, I don't know. Okay, anyways. There it is again. That's the third time within like, t that is the third time in nine minutes that that small rig RC220B fan kicked on. It's loud, it, it kicks on and off in little bursts. It's not ideal for talking heads. There goes that fan again. Fourth time in 13 minutes.